If the universe had skin, that skin would appear a sphere of clear, cold light. Within that skin would be a vast, luminous interior ablaze with innumerable tiny jewels. All that light, brilliant and dark, was originally contained in a single point of space and time, no larger than a hydrogen atom of today. We cannot say what it was that preceded that single tiny incipient universe. Some might say there was no before, others say an infinitude of other such points of incipience going back into eternity. We do know that after a period of radical change and rapid inflation, the beginnings of all we know of today took form. Not atoms in the void, but atoms and the light. Under the inexorable influence of gravity, it's clear that the very first stars coalesced out of the rapidly expanding and cooling primordial matter of the time. The first stars that took form some 13 billion years ago lived very brief but productive lives. Their rapid and explosive death throes converted the primordial elements, primarily hydrogen and helium, into all the complex atomic structures we know of today. Those new elements, especially that of carbon, became the basis for the kinds of long chains of molecules making our kind of life possible in what might otherwise be a lifeless universe. Later generations of stars took form out of the kinds of cold, dark matter that we see against the light of other stars today. That type of cold, dark matter is not the dark matter of physicists. That dark matter is unlikely to turn out to be matter at all. Such dark matter gives texture and form to what would otherwise be a universe without shape or form. It is well established by astronomers that stars take form in groups. These groups, known as star clusters, form as waves of light from brighter, more luminous stars stream through cold, dark matter, helping that matter bunch up to the point where gravity can take over, draw it together into globules, the first phase of stellar genesis. During later phases of stellar genesis, the globules begin to rotate and condense, the resulting accretion disk marking the boundaries of the solar system to come. Out of that accretion disk will precipitate a single central star with a group of cooler bodies following orbital paths based on the swirling of the original disk. Our own solar system precipitated out of such an accretion disk some five billion years ago Due to the effects of gravitational tides in our galaxy, the Milky Way, our Sun and its retinue of planets, moons, asteroids, comets and lesser bodies is no longer part of a birth cluster comprised of other stars. Interestingly, many stars retain a connection with at least one other sibling star after fledging. Such multiple stars make up about 30% of the individual stars visible to astronomical telescopes. In globular clusters, thousands of stars can retain complex relationships. Globular clusters go right back to the very beginnings of our universe. The life history of a star falls into three main phases, growth, maturity, and death. Unlike we human beings, the growth phase of stars happens very quickly and is distinguished by a period of dull luminosity based primarily on squeezing the heat out of cold dark matter. The death phase of stars can occur at a more leisurely pace than the growth cycle. Old stars can be thought of as a star within a star. 
Outwardly, such a star appears a glowing red of relatively huge proportion compared to its former size. Within that bloated exterior lies a core of intense superluminous radiation whose pressure caused the swelling seen from space. During the middle phase, maturity, a star is said by astronomers to lie on the main sequence. It is a period where the star consists of several well-structured strata, including a dense core within an outer skin of nucleosynthesis, surrounded by a thick mantle, visible photosphere, and outer corona. Nucleosynthesis is the heart of a star's ability to radiate energy. Without it, our sun would have become a cold, dark ember within 100,000 years of formation. Nucleosynthesis converts primordial atoms, such as hydrogen and helium, to heavier ones called metals by astronomers. Even heavier metals are created during a star's death as a nova or supernova. A star begins to die when it starts to run out of primordial atoms for conversion to metals. At this point, its core is very large, radiation pressure is intense, and its mantle begins to separate from its core, denying the surface of the core its supply of fuel. Whenever fuel is completely denied to the core, radiation pressure falls off and the mantle collapses under the influence of its own weight. Nucleosynthesis is reignited and the mantle driven away once again. The star alternately brightens and dulls, becoming variable in brightness. Although there are other causes for variability in stars, this tidal mechanism of fuel depletion and supply also accounts for the alternate swelling and subsidence of stellar size as well as periods when stars begin to cast off shrouds of matter into space. When stars have reached an advanced stage of aging, they can be seen by astronomers to be ensconced in brightly colored nebulosity. At this phase, the variable star becomes a planetary nebula, but ultimately, the fundamental conflict between radiation pressure and gravitational collapse becomes so extreme that the star may go nova as one final rush of fuel from the mantle makes contact with what is now an extremely large, hot, and well-fed core. The resulting nucleosynthesis now becomes of a scale as to fundamentally disrupt the integrity of the star as a whole. Stars, unlike we humans, can go out in a blaze of glory, leaving behind a tiny Earth-sized glowing core that slowly cools to oblivion. During a star's maturity, it goes through a long period of slowly brightening, intensifying its light. The intensification of a star's light takes the form of a light of higher and higher frequencies as the core swells and nucleosynthesis sites on its perimeter increase in number. Astronomers believe that our own sun will put out a frequency and intensity of light that will make life on Earth impossible within one billion years. At that time, our then hotter, bluer sun's rays will boil away the Earth's oceans and strip away its atmosphere. We human beings will have to have made some significant changes in how and where we live long before that. Time will tell. How will you feel without the flesh to touch with Or the tears to lament your loss With passions unabated and pleasures uncreated How will you count the cost? Oh, time will